well, welcome back, everyone, uh, to this one of the stream sessions. I'm just looking around. My, I have a horror that everyone will turn up in one session and, and there'll be no one in the other ones. That's happened to me, you know. <laughs> so um, welcome to this one. Uh, I think it's the most interesting one, uh, uh, in part because we've got uh, Nina Terry and Terry Moran uh, with us in large part. Um, but the topic, I think, is one that's on everybody's mind. Uh, particularly in Australia, I think. Um, sound policy processes, fast-paced government, uh, can we bring them together? Um, I guess it raises the question, what do we mean by sound policy uh, processes or even sound policy? And we should all know what that means. Uh, policy that actually does good, that's based on some kind of process that gives you a fair idea that it is going to do good. Um, and that actually gets implemented uh, and doesn't get reversed uh, prematurely. Well, observers of the Australian uh, scene, I guess, um, will be conscious that we've had a number of quite important policy areas that don't really, really pass those tests. Um, a well-worn PowerPoint presentation of mine starts off with a, a slide I call the post-2005 National Reform Scorecard. Um, and down one side I've got a range of uh, recent major policy areas like work choices, national broadband network, the mining uh, rent tax, carbon policy, um, and a swag of things in the 2014 budget like uni fee deregulation, uh, etc. And across the other side I've got columns stalled, implemented partly or fully, and reversed partly or fully. Well, not too many get right through, and the ones that get through to be fully implemented actually got fully reversed. Um, and we can think of the mining tax uh, and indeed the, the carbon tax. So it's been an interest, interesting times in the Chinese sense probably um, for observers of the Australian policy scene. The great thing about these conferences is we also bring uh, people from New Zealand, and we've heard a, kind of a different story this morning, I think, from the New Zealand participants. Um, I guess when you think about why those things fail, the question is, you know, did they fail because the processes behind them were deficient in, in various ways? And if that's the case, why might that be so? Um, and, and we haven't rehearsed the answers to this, so I'm not sure what, uh, what Nina and Terry are going to say about that, but it's open for discussion. And after some preliminary um, uh, presentations uh, by our two speakers, the floor's open and we've got a lot of people in the room, so I want to leave a lot of, lot of time uh, for discussion. Um, I don't think Terry Moran needs any introduction and there's a, um, his bio is in the, in the booklet that you've all got. Um, I mean, clearly uh, uh, his most important job from the point of view of people in this room and this topic uh, was Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet from 2008 to 2011. So he had the top job at the federal level, but he also had the top job at a state level for a significant period of time, about eight years, I think, Terry, in, in Victoria. So he, he comes very highly credentialed. Like Peter Shergold, who, who we saw last night give the Patterson Lecture, uh, Terry makes an ongoing contribution to public life. Uh, and this is just one example of it for which we're grateful, Terry. And Nina Terry, who shares, shares the Terry part of the name, but in the spelt, surname, spelt uh, is also becoming well known to ANZOG audiences and she's kindly participated in a number of things. She's one of Think Place's global executive uh, team and again her bio's there. She holds a PhD in design thinking and public sector management. And design thinking, I think, is a very interesting concept uh, and one that we'll hear a bit about and to see to what extent uh, it's part of the solution. So without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Terry Moran. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gary, and thank you also for the invitation to be with you today. Uh, in reflecting on Brexit and in a clear-sighted essay, Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, an old friend of the foundation dean, Alan Fells, and a frequent visit to Australia over the years commented, and I'm quoting him, what the vote revealed and the winning margin was larger than in three of the past four US presidential elections 
is a growing and dangerous divide between the political class, often a metropolitan elite, and a large number of people who feel left out of the economic prosperity centred on London and disenfranchised by political correctness. Among the latter, and I'm still quoting King, insecurity has been growing for years. The result in part of the impact of globalisation on real wage wages and high levels of immigration. It is a problem afflicting many industrialised countries. And he concludes, yet the political class, still in a state of shock and disbelief, show few signs of recognising the cause of its undoing. This is an observation which actually has much relevance to Australia in the here and now. Look back 45 years when the debate inside and outside of our national parliament began on the question, how do we shape a modern Australia? Parliamentarians, such as the famous Bert Kelly, various government agencies, including the predecessor of the Productivity Commission, as it was then called initially the Tariff Board and then the Industries Assistance Commission, individual public servants, academics, journalists, especially those from Fairfax and The Australian, business, unions, and various community organisations persisted in a long debate which was both public and private. Over 15 years, this group built understanding and acceptance of the elements of the major innovation of Australia best described in Paul Kelly's The End of Certainty, the first in a trilogy of major books on Australia's transformation, which is still the best work of modern Australian history. Although Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser took the first reform steps, it was the Hawke, Keating, Howard, Costello period which took us on a reform roller co coaster ride touching macro and microeconomics, welfare, industrial relations reform, regulation reform within our federation and more. We made a serious stab at being a globalised economy with industries relying on our competitive strengths. I would agree with others who say that it was this extended period of reform, enjoying mainly bipartisan support, which gave us 25 years of continuous economic growth in the midst of massive restructuring of our economy and government services as we move to a greater emphasis on the broader services sector within a globalised economy and higher rates of population growth. Surprisingly for some, half the new economic sectors in which we have found competitive strength and thus export strength are within the public sector or have been heavily influenced by it. Naturally, political leaders get the credit, but many people contributed. In one sense, it was Treasury as an institution with the intellectual and te technical depth and an irritating habit, admittedly, of giving forthright advice, which was sufficient to build agreement and shape policy coherence. The public faced many anxieties, and large numbers of people lost jobs, but many more jobs than were lost were created, especially in the major cities and nearly all of the significant regional cities. Some see this as a golden age of reform, but I don't. It was merely a time when our democracy worked well under the stewardship of a series of capable leaders and highly professional public sector departments and agencies. Nonetheless, we are clearly headed into a period of grumpy anxiety in Australia, particularly outside the booming inner cities, uh, inner city areas of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. In these other regions, incomes are stagnant, cost of living pressures keenly felt, and in some areas, further structural change in the economy is creating dislocation. You can see the effect of this in the relative lack of trust in political and business leadership and the media. This has been apparent in Morgan polling for some time, and the same pattern is evident in some recent work by another Attitudes Research company. Conversely, there is abundant trust and goodwill for the frontline service delivery people in the public sector. Indeed, if politicians achieve the level of trust enjoyed by nurses, firefighters, teachers, and other major public sector occupations, they would be really equipped to move Australia forward. It is startling that contemporary politicians, when they attack service delivery occupation, occupations in the name of organisational change, market-based reforms, outsourcing and privatisation, are pitting themselves against people the public actually likes and wants more of. 
Thus, we have our own version of Mervyn King's dichotomy between the political class and the communities of Australia. Does it matter, though? Apart from economic management, to which I'll return, there is the broad question of the state of service delivery in which those most trusted of Australians are employed. Frankly, an unsettling number of major reform initiatives are not working well. Outsourced employment services, never tested in a high unemployment period, have little success in helping those struggling most, and we have now unemployment hotspots with 20% plus unemployment, although nobody in Canberra seems to notice or care. The aged care market is emerging as a mass of regulatory and procedural overkill with insufficient services for those assessed as needing them. Our once admired VET system is a disaster with poor outcomes and quite a lot of fraud. Primary care doesn't join up to integrate services and work and keep people away from the hospital door. And even in respect of research funding, the basis of an innovative and agile economy, it's uh, micromanaged to within an inch of its life and is underperforming in terms of what those very same people in different circumstances could achieve. Worst of all, our results in schooling have been in decline for nearly 15 years. These are just some of the troubled areas in which initiatives taken by the Commonwealth have proceeded in the belief that the private sector does a better, more efficient job than the public sector, most particularly the states. This is an untested proposition with no comprehensive effort by the Commonwealth to prepare and publish evaluations which are then considered in a respectful manner. And the only exceptions to that of which I'm aware are occasional good pieces of work from the Productivity Commission. Also, no value is placed on the ethics and values of public service and the culture which sustains them. As to the economy, we have taken most of the traditional macro and microeconomic medicine but seem to have no strong, strong tested proposition as to what to do next. And so innovation and agility are fine, but the game rests with business now. One would expect business enthusiasm for a number of the transformative activities which an innovative business in the US would attend to. Also, the Commonwealth seems not to worry about what business needs to do to become more innovative and agile. If it did look, it would probe, for example, business investment in R&D as a proportion of gross domestic product, which according to ABS stats, has declined markedly and continuously since 2008-9. Business investment in workforce skills, data now is hard to find, it used to be readily available, but anecdotally there are suggestions that this is in decline. Registration of patents by Australians, remembering that Australians make up only a small proportion of the total registrations in Australia, which seems not to be growing significantly. And finally, the capability of boards and senior executives in large businesses to steer strategic, perhaps risky innovation, when such a high proportion of them have a background in financial management and the law for, for the purpose of supporting the compliance obligations of Australian corporations. And some of you might remember a uh, survey which was published recently, the end point of which was to acknowledge that there was more innovation in the public sector than in the private sector. And I think there are a number of reasons why that's probably so. Arguably, we have a problem at the national level in achieving innovation and agility in the economy, while also reforming service delivery to improve performance in a number of key areas. The Brookings Institute has just published a fascinating monograph by Elaine C. Carmack, a senior fellow in the Governance Studies Program, as well as the director of the Centre for Effective Public Management at the Brookings Institute. And Ms. Carmack writes in Why Presidents Fail and How They Can Succeed Again, that what presidents do and how they do it sheds light on success or failure. As Brookings itself explains it, Carmack argues that presidents today spend too much time talking and not enough time governing, and that they have allowed themselves to become more and more distant from the federal bureaucracy that is supposed to implement policy. After decades of imperial and rhetorical presidencies, we are in need of a managerial president, as um, the Brookings comment would have it. Now, this work has already received high praise and it has direct relevance to Australia, the UK, 
and the problems we face at the moment. It's available, by the way, on Amazon. I think it's about $10, although I don't recall whether that was a dollars Australian or dollars US. And it's, Dean, it's really worth a read. You should recommend it to your students. A key conclusion from Carmack's research is that presidents must find a balance between policy, communication and implementation. She argues that major initiatives have founded in the United States because one or two of those responsibilities of presidents have been given insufficient attention. She is particularly critical of the excessive emphasis given to communication at the cost of sorting out implementation issues. We can find quite a few examples of this among Australia's political leaders to sit alongside the presidents she has studied. So, quoting now Ms Carmack from her own work, in her own words, this book will argue that a successful presidential leadership occurs when the president is able to put together and balance three sets of skills, policy, communication and implementation. When there is no balance, when the compo components of leadership are out of whack, failure follows. Each piece is as important as the next. She then gives a number of examples of things that presidents have said and done over the years. In this case, examples of success, where the rhetoric was matched by action. But um, she also concludes this quote by saying, this same model of leadership applies to leaders in other large enterprises as in politics. Leaders in business fail when they cannot execute. And I would say that one of the reasons why we have a problem in Canberra at the moment is that within the public service itself, there's too little understanding of the need to balance off those three main areas and the Commonwealth is particularly weak on some areas of implementation, not all. But I'd go one step further in the Australian context and this affects policy. Microeconomics is no longer by itself useful in sorting through domestic policy problems as in the past. The, the public is over it and po politicians cannot win back their support for it. If the success of business and innovation, agility and growth is the economic challenge we now face, we need people in the public service who approach these problems with knowledge of how successful business people view them and act. Indeed, we need public servants who understand, understand how entrepreneurs think and operate and what obstacles to their success need to be removed. When it comes to service delivery, better markets and pricing is not enough. We need to build integrated public service responses to the needs of citizens at the community level using international best practice and a willingness to let public service professionals have more freedom within a robust framework of pricing, accountability and performance measurement. The policy teams need people who have frontline service delivery experience. Education, health and welfare policy work is of little value without them. We already have examples of this in, in Australia. For example, the success of the Rudd reforms to governance, funding and accountability of public hospitals, agreed by all governments and now implemented successfully. But beyond these matters, we need a thoroughgoing, all-in community debate that's broad about how to chart our future direction as a nation. I would hope that it has the vitality and common sense that brought us to the reforms which started 30 years ago. If done well, without cant and defensiveness, without trivial tactical plays, it will build the basis for a broad consensus of what needs to be done and empower political leaders to start the next long march to a better, prosperous, confident and inclusive Australia. Thank you. <clears throat>